beautiful object in my shirt. It's the only thing I think I've ever stolen in my life. <laughs> and I walk back to the orphanage and I bury it under the big rock where I used to go and have a bit of a cry when things got too tough. And one day, a temporary teacher comes down from Johannesburg, 400 miles away. It's about 700 kilometers away. And, and she's the first person I've ever known who said anything nice to me. And I took a walk and said, Please, miss, can, can, can you teach me to read this? And she opens up said, Oh my God, it's in English. I don't care. Just teach me to read it. Just teach me to read it. I learned to read English in three weeks. By the time I was 11, the book, by the way, was called The Abolition of Slavery in the Cape Province, 1834. At 830 pages, by the time I was 11, I could recite every single one of them. It's that Dallas book in the history of writing. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Bornstein went back to Johannesburg. Every month she sent me a couple of books and an exam paper. I'd read the books, do the exam, <coughs> get a self addressed on the road, and I'd, I'd walk the seven miles of town and post it. Better tell you about this often. You had a bad tooth, or you had your tooth hurt. They put you in a dining room chair and they tied your hands behind the chair like this, and then the matron lifted it onto its hind legs, and the local vet came. And with what, what he called, what he used for taking your teeth out was what he used on horses. And he'd go, whack! <laughs> Just seeing his false teeth, kids. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, at the age of 11, the sports team said, look, we've been together now since you're seven. We've been sending you stuff. I think you're pretty bright. There's a scholarship in South Africa for the most exclusive private school in South Africa. Things are astronomical. Never, I need a very, very, very well go to the school. But they have two scholarships. But 2,000 kids sit for this exam every year to get one of these two, either one of these two scholarships. You're not going to win it, Bryce. You're not going to win it because you're only 11. And the winners are always 14, and that's when they take you to the school, when you're 14. I think. And then, well, wait three more years in the shit house. No way. I write the exam. I'm told to this day, when they did a BBC program on me in South Africa some years ago, that it's still the single highest marks a child's ever achieved in the examination in South, South Africa. Because I'm clever. So I was out of there. <laughs> I was out of there. I was out of there. And I couldn't come. A story time. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Jesse, you good? Come on! <laughs> Anything, doesn't matter. Anybody read the power of love? Did anyone try to stop you from achieving your dream after that? <laughs> Did anyone try to stop you from achieving your dream after that? Or? Mostly me. <laughs> because we are we are our own worst enemies, seriously. When you have a dream, the worst obstacle you've got is you. But yeah, life with you know. <laughs> Okay, I want to be a storyteller. I won two scholarships from school, one to Oxford, one to the 200 University. Nobody advised me, so I was stupid enough to take the London University one. <laughs> the only reason I did that was because they had a school of journalism, the London School of Journalism, and I wanted to be a storyteller, a writer. So I went to London and I got a degree there, and, uh, and I was on my way. I uh, came to Australia to a band from South Africa because I started a school for Africans. 
I, the one thing that I had in my mouth was, was I could speak five African languages. And nobody at the school, because they were all wealthy kids, highly privileged, mostly like Singaporeans. And, <laughs> and, and, and they could, I'm only joking, you guys have to speak Mandarin, you have to speak five languages, it's fantastic, that's what they can read. <laughs> I can speak five African languages. And so I'm standing in the cricket field one day on the boundary. Now, cricket's an English game, so in the mountains, you don't, you've never heard of the game. And I'm bored, shit, and standing on the boundary like this. And over there, somebody is going clack, clack with a bat. And I hear a voice say to me in Zulu, you cause it. Can you teach me to read? And I said, yeah, I can teach you to read. See me after this stupid game. <laughs> <laughs> and it started from there. Now, Kwasi, the way he addressed me, was the normal way an African would address the European. Do you know what it means? First thing I said to him is, you call me because you again, I won't teach you to read. Uh, it started there, and on, on Saturdays and su Saturday afternoons and Sundays, I had classes in the school hall. Now, this used to be the most prestigious school in the country. And they're not using their hall on Saturday and Sunday, and these all the they, the groundsmen and people from the in a very rich suburb the cooks and the gardeners and the sweepers and everybody. They, they, they used to wear these they mismatched suits and they colours and they were terribly clean and they were white and they were green. And then and the hair that was beautiful and they'd have a slate and a stylus. And I teach them. I teach them how to you know that bad am I? And and I and, and I and I taught them and we had a wonderful time. And the police raided. The police raided my school. 